Okay, we'll welcome everyone uh, in person and online to tonight's event um, celebrating the publication of Ryan Carr's book, uh, Samson Occam, Radical Hospitality in the Native Northeast. Uh, my name is Matthew Engelke. Uh, I am I teach here at Columbia in the religion department. I was until very recently the director of the Institute for Religion, Culture, and Public Life, um, and was was the editor of the series uh, in which the book ha has appeared. Um, so that's part of why I'm here, and it's 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 a real pleasure um, to be here and to be chairing this event this evening with Ryan and and our guests. Um, I have to say, as as the editor of a of a book series, it's you know one of the most exciting things is receiving manuscripts um, from people working well outside your field who just manage to really um, just you know kindle such an excitement and um, in in the work that they're doing and and Ryan's book was just such a um, a joy to um, come across and to be able to to publish in the series. Uh, we have since that point been able to uh, have many conversations over the past few years uh, in relation not only to Samson Occam but um, common interests in uh, in religion in the core curriculum here at uh, Columbia in ideas of the public sphere and many other topics as well. I think you'll you'll see if you have not had a chance to read the book or indeed if you have already how Ryan is able to bring together such incredibly rich material, primary material, uh, and, and bring this figure to life. Uh, but situating Occam within a series of debates and conceptual arguments around the stranger, hospitality, uh, the relationships between Christianity and settler, settler colonialism, it's, it's just such a rich study and, and so beautifully written. So um, it's a real pleasure to be here. And I've used most of my three minutes uh, to, to, to give a bit of a, um, a, a, a commentary myself, but uh, such is the excitement that this book generates. Uh, but my role is largely uh, ceremonial and organizational. Tonight, uh, I will be um, introducing the speakers and um, and then uh, directing a bit of Q and A at the end. So let me just say a bit about the the structure for tonight. Um, Ryan is going to start us off, and then we're going to have uh, responses um, from uh, Hillary Weiss, um, Amy. Uh, Basaw Medford and, and Dustin Stewart, and then Ryan will respond to the panelists, and then um, there will be time for Q&A from you all. So thank you all so much. Um, let me just make the introductions. Ryan Carr is, is a lecturer here in English and Comparative Literature, American Studies, and the Core Curriculum. He works at the intersection of Indigenous Studies and Early American Studies. He was trained as a scholar of the 19th century, uh, but his more recent work goes further back in time, exploring overlooked connections between literary and religious cultures in the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, in, in the order that I had, so Hillary will be next. Yes, um, Hillary, is it Weiss? Is, is, Weiss. Weiss, okay, excuse me. <laughs> Engelke gets, gets it too, yeah. believe me. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Hilary Wiss is the Alan K. Smith and Gwendolyn Miles Smith Professor of English at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. She began at Trinity after nearly 20 years at Auburn University, where she taught courses on early American women writers, transatlantic 18th century writing, Native American literature, and early American life writing. She is the author of over a dozen articles uh, and book chapters, as well as three books on Native American literacy practices in early America. She has served on the editorial board of the journals Studies in 18th Century Culture and Early American Literature, and as president of the Society of Early Americanists. She has won teaching awards at Auburn University, as well as national research grants to support her work. So thank you for joining us. Amy Bissaw Medford is a research affiliate at the Harvard Project on Indigenous Governance and Development at the Harvard Kennedy School, 
an analyst for the Taylor Policy Group, and an associate of the Native Nations Institute at the University of Arizona. Amy researches programs, reviews, and designs analytical reports regarding Native government. She co-founded and currently serves on the board of directors for the Calumet and Cross Heritage Society. Previously, Amy was the director of Honoring Nations at the Harvard Project and manager of program development at the Native Nations Institute. And she is also a, um, a member of Brothertown. Dustin Stewart is Associate Professor of English and Comparative Literature here at Columbia. He specializes in the literature and culture of the later 17th and uh, 18th centuries with broader interests in poetics and theology. He's taught courses at Columbia on British poetry from John Milton to Romanticism, the prehistory of the Gothic, religion and the English novel, mobility and emotion in the Enlightenment, and the literature of the non-human from angels to AI. So might sit in on one of those courses one of these days. His, his first book titled Futures of Enlightenment Poetry won the Louis Gottschalk Prize for the year's best academic book on an 18th century topic. So um, thank you all once again for joining us and to our panelists. So I will turn it over to Ryan for um, eight minutes of um, introductory <laughs> remarks and I'll, I'll, I'll be, uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Matthew. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here for a ton of reasons, but um, it's great to have my series editor as the chair and um, thank you so much to all of you for coming out from out of town and for Justin and to Lindsay especially for, um, for organizing this. Um, okay, so I have eight minutes. I can't possibly tell you the story of Samson Ockham's life. You know, he's far too interesting for eight minutes. Um, the, you know, the, I guess the bullet points are that everyone needs to know is that he was born in 1723. He died in 1792. He was born in Mohegan um, and he died um, adjacent in the town next to Brother Town in upstate New York, which is the a confederated nation that he helped found in the 1770s um, of coastal Algonquian tribes who moved um, to upstate New York on what, what was o Oneida territory to have um, a new nation. Um, and, uh, you know, Occam is famous for many reasons, one of, one of which is that he was the first ordained indigenous Protestant minister. Um, he was also famous as the kind of person who raised all the money that founded Dartmouth College, even though he didn't think he was doing that. <laughs> the money kind of got stolen. Um, but in any case, um, I'm not, I, I, you, Occam is wonderful and I wish I could talk about his whole life, but I just want to kind of unpack the main argument of the book, um, which is that uh, Samson Occam was a traditionalist and his traditionalism, um, it was from the standpoint of his traditionalism that he became an evangelical. And, um, and from the standpoint of his tra traditionalism, which was evangelical, that he became um, politically important in, in, in the foundation, especially of Brothertown, which was a nation of, um, of confederated nation, as I mentioned. And, and so what's, I, you know, what's behind this idea that Occam was a traditionalist? Um, it's, 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 I think it's relatively uncontroversial to say that um, he cared about tradition, which is something that is not um, con controversial. But, but the question of traditionalism, um, to be a traditionalist is, I think, more than caring about tradition. It's, it's, it's kind of mobilizing tradition as a, as a cause with some sort of social and political um, uh, teeth to it. And, and I, you know, for me, it's been helpful to think about traditionalism as a solution to a problem. You know, what is the political or social problem that traditionalism addresses? Um, and, and for Occam, you know, it was colonialism. Um, um, uh, and, and colonialism, was part of the context that turned him into a traditionalist. You know, he 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 cared about traditions um, anyway, but um, traditionalism was a was a was a political and social program that he um, undertook as a way of responding to colonialism. And it's not just because colonialism doesn't like tradition. You know, indigenous tradition. There's this. There's. It's easy enough to say that well, Native American traditions must be repressed or um, effaced by colonialism. But that's really uh, that that can be true in some cases, obviously, but. But colonialism also plays the role of eliciting traditionalism in the sense that um, we're familiar with from talking about things like the politics of recognition. You know, um, colonial people, colonists, they want to know if, if they're dealing with authentic indigenous people. And so colonialism also puts demands on native people, including Occam, to somehow attest to being real Indians. 
And, and Occam was involved with that. You know, he, was, he had to involve himself in the politics of authenticity. And one way in which he did that, you can read in his autobiographies from 1765 and 1768, he talks about how he was raised a heathen. And, and often these narratives, these autobiographies of Occam's are read as kind of conversion narratives where he talks about how he became a Christian and he kind of assimilated to, to white norms. But really, if you, the reason he, he wrote them was precisely the opposite. It was to prove to white people that he had once been a heathen. Um, and so this, um, the way that the colonial context produces traditionalism is a big part of the story here, um, partly because um, once you, as once Occam, as an indigenous person in Mohegan especially, came out as a traditionalist, there were other Mohegans who said, you're not a real traditionalist. You know, we, we, there, traditional, traditionalism became a kind of contested um, terrain. And so there were folks at Mohegan who had a very different conception of traditionalism than Occam. And I argue in the book that Occam's traditionalism really emphasized native traditions of hospitality. Um, and for Occam, traditionalism and the traditions that he most cared about were the ones that involved how did native communities deal with people from outside um, and from outside the community. And there were other versions of traditionalism at Mohegan that were about other things. Um, and, but, but I think the part of the reason that Occam um, was informed by these particular traditions was that he, was, he followed in the footsteps of Uncas, who was the, the kind of great 17th century Mohegan sachem who made an alliance with English um, people as a way of kind of um, uh, protecting the interests of the Mohegan tribe. Occam was very informed, I think, by that tradition. Um, but it, he also became, he also, the reason that Occam, um, his traditionalism found expression um, as, as evangelicalism, because evangelicalism was a way of, um, for Native people to keep doing what they had always done, which was being hospitable to strangers. Um, so in my, in my, in my book, I'm, I'm, I'm very influenced by scholars of evangelicalism, some of whom are present, who have, who have thought about evangelicalism as not so much as a doctrine or a theology or a kind of religion, but evangelicalism is, is, especially in the 18th century, better understood as a way of being social, a form of sociability, and a set of practices and, and norms um, that allow, that, that encourage people to be outward facing with their religion and to, and to have a kind of transnational approach, if, if you like, to, um, to, to Christian sociability. Um, so this was the style of, of religion that really spoke to Occam because I think he saw it as a way that he could keep doing what his people had always done, which was to reach out to people from other nations um, and to kind of uh, be hospitable to the, to the broader world. So that's a, that's a big part of the argument of the book. Um, you know, I suppose that the, as a literary scholar, the part that, that, I, that really got me interested in the project was that the idea that um, just by writing and sharing his, his, his literature, you know, his, his written words with, with, a, with a broad public through the medium of print, for, for example, but also through sermons, um, that Occam's used language as a kind of a medium of hospitality. Um, but, but there's also another argument in the book that it, I think has become more important to me over, over time, which is that evangelicalism wasn't just about um, language and um, if linguistic interaction, it was also about perception. And, and, and this, in this respect, Occam was very much of his 18th century moment, because one way, of, there's a lot of ways of describing the theology of, of evangel evangelical people, but Jonathan Edwards looms large, and Occam was, a, was worship, he didn't worship Jonathan Edwards, but he really liked him. <laughs> um, and, and I think the most exciting archival discovery I found was Occam's annotated copy of Edwards' Freedom of the Will. And, and what, what Edwards writes about, one of the things he writes about in that book is how and this is a common theme in Edwards' writings, that it's one thing to know, to know God, you know, to have an intellectual approach to the sacred, but it's another thing to feel it. So he has, Edwards has this famous metaphor about, you know, you can know what honey tastes like, that it's sweet. I, have, I, just, I know that honey's sweet, but, but to, to know the sweetness of honey by tasting it um, is a different way of experiencing um, creation, if you like. And I think Occam was very influenced by this idea that religion, um, is not so much about uh, cognitive activities as it is about a way of sensing the world. And, um, and, and there's, there's various places in Occam's writings where this becomes very relevant to the way he approached colonialism, because one way of thinking about colonialism is that it's a bad way of looking at the world. 
Um, and, and Occam in one, I'm just going to read a brief quote from one of Occam's petitions where he talks about, um, he says, our forefathers lived upon the spontaneous product of this country, but we find that the war has stripped us of all we used to have. All the fountains abroad that used to water and refresh our wilderness are dried up and the springs that used to rise near are all ceased. And so this, this sense that um, nature itself has been, is no longer a source of all help um, and that to live in the North American landscape is no longer uh, living in reciprocity with a helpful nature. For Occam, that was a way of describing what colonialism had done to his people. So, so one way that he understood um, sovereignty, I think, and, and indigenous liberation was as a perceptual discipline, trying to, trying to help his people see the world in the way that they had before colonialism turned everything into basically a, a grab for resources, you know, the, to, to, to put it crudely. Um, and so the, there's various places in, in Occam's writings that I, you know, I don't really have time to unpack where, where he, he frames um, religious experience as, as an awakening. And this is really the, the, if you want to understand Occam's relationship to something like the Great Awakening, I think you really have to pass through this, this, these really serious phenomenological um, issues about perception and the way that colonialism um, affects it uh, as a way of kind of seeing what he was up to. So maybe I'll just, um, I think I'll just leave it there because I want to leave plenty of time for questions. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Hillary. Yeah. All right, well, thank you. Um, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you for uh, the invitation to be here. Uh, and I just want to say, uh, it, just sort of acknowledge that we are on native land and um, as somebody who teaches at Trinity College, it is one of the great joys of my existence that I am in the state that Samson Occam uh, spent much of his life in uh, Mohegan is, is down the road from, well, quite down the road, but still down the road from where, where I teach now. So, um, okay, and I've written out my comments because, you know, I can talk for a long time. So I will um, try to stay, stick with my, my written comments. Uh, Ryan's introduction effectively lays out the problem of writing about Samson Occam in relation to indigenous New England more generally. Here is this brilliant and extraordinary figure, this writer, intellectual, theologian, who is somehow expected to stand in for indigeneity in 18th century New England to celebrate his exceptional achievements is somehow to erase the violence and injustice of his moment, to suggest that the devastation of settler colonialism were somehow a choice. However, to dismiss Occam's work as exceptional is to close down one of the most important voices in colonial New England. Fortunately for us, Ryan Carr's book is a thoughtful and sensitive engagement with the full range of Occam's work. Rather extraordinarily, despite the appearance in 2006 of Joanna Brooks's 400 plus page collection of Occam's writings, and more have been recovered since that book came out, um, classrooms continue to focus on two works, the autobiographical narrative and the execution sermon. And while Occam has been extensively written about in articles and in parts of books, my own included, Ryan's is the first full-length study in several generations to fully embrace the written oeuvre of this incredible person. In doing so, Ryan brings forward Occam's full appreciation of the specific cultural experience of his beloved indigenous community. One of the things that struck me powerfully as I read this book is that Ryan's primary task is to break free of the academic vocabulary that has largely defined the study of indigenous New England for the past several decades. Words like syncretic, literacy, traditional, authenticity, conversion, have become stale, conventional, codes that erase rather than elucidate. These are not inaccurate terms, and the concepts behind them are important, even essential, to understanding Occam's moment and achievements. However, they've tended to short circuit our understanding of what Occam is doing, saying. We might even equate this to parenthood, those trite conventional phrases. They grow up so fast, or the most important job you'll ever do. 
that are utterly meaningless until they apply to you, when suddenly they perfectly encapsulate your experience. Brian Carr's contribution is to defamiliarize academic phrases and conversations to make available to readers in the 21st century the full extent of Occam's insights. He does this most effectively by sidestepping the conventionalized frameworks for situating Occam and instead bringing forward concepts and contexts that emerge directly from Occam himself. Ryan's emphasis on agency is a case in point. Carr writes of Occam's emphasis throughout his life on, and I'm quoting from Ryan, his own agency as a person, as well as the collective self-determination of the tribal peoples to whom he belonged. A corollary is the concept of literary sovereignty, which is a riff on Robert Warrior's phrasing that refers specifically, and again, it's a quote, to the textual mediation of indigenous power in a world shaped by settler colonialism. Right, so it's specifically the textual piece of it. As Ryan writes later, quote, Occam opened a channel of communication with readers about what he wanted them to know. Our work then is to engage with this by what Ryan calls reading obviously, or what Carr points out is accepting at face value the words Occam offers us rather than seeking hidden meanings. The confidence with which Ryan makes this set of claims situating them neatly within scholarly frameworks masks their significance. As an academic whose career largely rests on reading the words of early indigenous intellectuals like Samson Occam and others, it is profoundly moving to have this approach made explicit. Carr insists that we read what Occam says. He is telling you what he wants you to know and how to process it. Ryan flags for us the ways Occam's fascination with Christianity is specific to his moment. The evangelizing of the Great Awakening in the 1740s resonated with young Occam's commitments to his own people and the promise of a new approach to community and connection. That is, that this potentially, that, that this potential largely didn't come to pass makes Occam's commitments harder to see from a modern perspective, but no less compelling. His fault if we must attribute one to him, was not in his theology, but rather his unwillingness to recognize how powerfully the settler colonial mindset refused the kind of community kinship Occam imagined in Christianity. Ultimately, Occam came to conclude, as Ryan lays out in part three of his book, that Christian theology and indigeneity not only overlap but even more importantly, that native communities were practicing a purer form of Christianity before the arrival of Europeans than anyone since. The extraordinary 1780s Brotherton pe petition that Ryan beautifully unpacks for us in chapter six centers this particular theology and its radical implications. Occam's deep study of Christian theology identified crucial areas of overlap between native New England practice and Christian principle, what Ryan calls radical hospitality and stranger love. Using Occam's criminally understudied Good Samaritan sermon, Ryan recovers the, way, the ways Occam's sophisticated theological readings of biblical parable, parables intersect with his appreciation of his own community ways. What Carr calls Occam's selective traditionalism is similar to what we might call selective biblicalism, really what characterizes all of Christianity. Ryan notes that Occam's investments are in Genesis, not Exodus, and the letters of Paul, the implications of which he explores at length in the middle section of the book, mainly chapters three and four, in relation to Mohegan habits of stranger love. By the time Ryan turns to that widely read and deeply familiar autobiographical text that is so widely taught in, in, in American literature classrooms, in chapter five, he has defamiliarized it for us from the unsettling of the indeterminate self slash seft, you have to read the book to know what I'm talking about, <laughs> <laughs> to reinscribing the text itself into native space, an artifact of the Brotherton years in upstate New York rather than the Dartmouth archive of New Hampshire, Carr makes fresh for us the implications of Occam's attention to injustice and inequity and the ways archives have historically occluded indigenous agency. All in all, this is an idiosyncratic and beautifully felt analysis of Occam's life's work. The first book to fully take 
this on in several generations. This is neither a biography nor a literary analysis. Instead, it's a finely calibrated, theologically engaged study of Occam's agency. The Occam that was drawn to the evangelical promise of the 1740s is not the same intellectual and political figure of the Brotherton years, where his theological work deepened and became increasingly complex. Ryan Carr gives full weight to the religious and cultural experiences that saturate Occam's writing, eschewing close analysis of the specifics of Occam's everyday life to follow strands of evangelical thought and indigenous political engagement into their furthest reaches, just as Occam would have wanted. <laughs> Thank you. On to Amy. Thank you so much. So um, I'm the non-academic on the panel, and um, my role is a researcher up at the Harvard Kennedy School, and I research tribal governments. Um, but I got to know Ryan because he's researching a tribal leader of mine. So I'm in Rolls Brother Town. Um, I descend from the Bruchelle family that comes from Mohegan. And um, I want to talk to you about what this book means to me as a Brothertown woman. And um, I'm going to start with Ryan as a researcher. Um, the fact that he reaches out to our communities, and I have to say communities because he doesn't just reach out to Brothertown, he reaches out to Mohegan as well. And he places Occam in both of these spaces um, without distinguishing which one's more important. And I think that's the first time that this really happens. And to have a scholar come into each of our communities, participate in discussions with us, um, and explore Occam in sort of a, a different way um, was just um, heartening. Um, I've spent a lot of time in academia. I've got two master's degrees, and I've spent a lot of time reading books about us um, that didn't include us. Um, so to have Ryan um, include that, that dialogue, that exchange, um, as he's researching, and as he's writing, and as he's developing these ideas, um, and editing his work, you know, that means a lot. Um, Ryan has participated in our Brothertown Book Club for a few years now, every Wednesday, every Wednesday night. Um, we discuss um, things like Occam, where we've gone in and, you know, read Occam's diaries. Um, you know, reading entries is one thing. Um, being able to have somebody provide the context in which these diaries are being written um, changes everything, right? Um, we get a better sense of the world in which Occam is living in that we as Brothertown people didn't experience. We have maybe heard these stories, but to hear it from a broader perspective than just ours really paints a really beautiful picture um, and something that we wouldn't have been able to have without a book like this. Um, the, the second piece, uh, I really want to go into uh, this sort of identity issue. Um, a lot of people, when they refer to Occam, only refer to him in his Mohegan identity. Um, and as a Brotherton Indian, it's been really hard. Um, we, he, we share him. He, he is both Mohegan and Brothertown. And, you know, he starts his life out as Mohegan. He experiences that sort of growing up culture, society, but he's a huge part in forming Brothertown Indian Nation, and he's a huge part of why we still exist today, even if we're in Wisconsin. Um, and th that means a lot. Not a lot of scholars have been able to um, fluidly talk about this dual identity um, without drawing clear lines in the sand. Um, Ryan and I were walking earlier today in the park and I was just reflecting to him that um, 
it really means a lot that he included the piece from Courtney Cottrell, who's Courtney Cottrell Gersetich now, um, who's the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for Brothertown, um, as she's trying to repatriate a pipe. And this re repatriation process, as she's going through it, she's being asked to clearly define Brothertown, where Brothertown begins and where Brothertown ends, and sort of cutting off the familial ties that we have with our other parent nations. And it, it felt abusive to her. You know, she writes that, that this was painful to have to experience the trauma of, of not only, you know, we, we know that our families had to leave the East Coast. We know they left, right? But then to have to relive this for a, a governmental process that um, is only trying to not include us is really hard. Um, so I appreciate you including that perspective into this piece of it. Um, lastly, um, The first time I heard about Samson Occam, um, I was a kid and I heard that he was a reverend and he was a Christian Indian. I didn't understand what that meant. And then I go to high school and I read about Christian Indians, um, but they're sort of represented as colonized, assimilated Indians. And then I'm with my grandma who is so in love with her Christian identity, where the church meant so much to her. It provided her such a foundation for her identity and her place in community. And I couldn't figure out what this Christian Indian term meant. It felt placed upon me. Um, I'm not even a Christian, but I'm a Christian Indian. Does that make sense you know I don't you know I'm I'm brother town so I'm already put in this Christian Indian identity and Ryan changes that through his work he's able to prevent present a different idea of what it is to be a Christian Indian and I never realized how much I needed to hear this sort of other perspective, a thing that I, I've always felt, which is that my grandmother was no less Indian because she went to church two times a week. That that did not make her less than. That Christianity provided so much for my ancestors and for my family. Um, that, and part of it came out in book club, right? This sort of pride in, in what Brothertown was able to accomplish and how Christianity played a, an important role in keeping part of our community together. And that didn't mean that it sacrificed our indigenous identity, not one bit. And so, uh, Ryan, those are my three things that I wanted to share for you. Thank you for being a courteous <laughs> scholar. Thank you for including Brothertown and Mohegan together. And thank you for helping to redefine this Christian identi Indian identity um, and place it in a book that allows other people to explore that in a deeper way. Thank you. <clears throat> I'll use my eight minutes to think about uh, Ryan as a literary interpreter. <clears throat> There's a delightful moment in Samson Occam's diary that Ryan Carr retells in opening the fourth chapter of his new book. Can you hear me okay? Um, the scene brings together two strangers at a doorway. Here's part of Ryan's adaptation. On the rainy morning of October 9th, 1785, 
a farmer in the upper Hudson River Valley answered a knock at his door to find a man he had never seen before. The man was elderly, drenched to the bone, with long gray hair and dark skin, English-style clothes, a splendid gold-headed cane, refined manners, and a proud, even magisterial air. The farmer invited the man in, gave him a seat by the fire, and tried making small talk. The interaction, as Ryan goes on to explain, isn't pleasant. The host has acted generously in welcoming the oddly dressed stranger into his home, but their resulting chit chat is awkward. Eventually the host, presumably happy to have an excuse, mentions that he needs to leave soon uh, to go hear a famous preacher who has come to town. I suppose I should hear him, the stranger responds. It's possible, just possible, that the stranger is picking up on the fact that his host feels uncomfortable and wants to slip away. Maybe the stranger is messing with the farmer at least a little bit in proposing to accompany him and hear the celebrity preacher's sermon. You can't get rid of me that easily. Soon the stranger breaks up the awkwardness he's been puckishly stretching out by disclosing himself, but he doesn't do that directly. He makes a joke. Referring to the visiting preacher, he announces, the people could not see that strange creature till I get there. The gag takes a second to land, but then the <laughs> farmer gets it. His guest is the celebrity preacher. The stranger sitting in his house by his fire is the same strange creature he's expecting to see in the pulpit from a distance. The host finds himself in the intimate company of the Reverend Samson Occam. He knows this because Occam, had, Occam has revealed it. But the revelation was oblique, as most jokes are, and far from complete. Even afterward, there's a lot about Occam that the farmer doesn't know and probably can't know. Ryan's book is about what he calls stranger love. Readers in literary studies like me uh, um, and students in other fields that are adjacent to mine, especially early American literature, will be primed uh, for links to work on the subject of stranger sociability. This term, uh, I'm going to try to be general in describing it, this term has been adapted and popularized in the field by Michael Warner. What follows is a really reductive summary. I feel the reductiveness, especially because of the presence in the room of Michael Warner. Um, who, Warner makes it central to his account of, uh, sorry about this, the, the formation of an evangelical public sphere in 18th century America. The sphere came together to put the story simply, really simply, um, thanks to a new paradigm in which preachers always expected to address audiences of strangers, or preachers addressing an audience of strangers. Ryan does write about evangelical media technologies in the new book. And he has a fair bit to say about Occam's use of these uh, transatlantic outlets and his idea of broadcasting more generally. But I see the book as also wanting to focus on and even to work at a smaller scale. Ryan repeatedly invites us to think about what it might mean, what it, what it might involve to establish communicative intimacy with a single stranger. He tends to represent intimacy in terms of space that is provisionally, tenuously shared by two interlocutors, or maybe two groups, with some risk involved on either side. Intimacy happens in the doorway or the hearth occupied by a host and an unknown guest. It can be a beautiful thing, but it's always shadowed by the possibility of awkwardness. The book's main argument describes an intimate merger between two supposedly antagonistic traditions. Ryan makes the case that Occam's theory and practice of stranger love reflect both his commitment to extending native customs and lifeways and his, and his approach to practicing and promoting uh, evangelical Christianity. We've heard a little bit about that already. These separate worlds didn't seem compatible in the same way or to the same extent to, to very many other people in the native Northeast, Ryan admits. But in Occam and in others, he contends, the two surprisingly converged. These two worlds tenuously shared space. 
The big payoff here, interpretively speaking, is that within this frame, some of the writings by Occam that seem the most self-enclosed in their evangelicalism do in fact uh, speak um, provocatively to his indigenous experiences and commitments. One tradition acts as a vehicle for the other. The ideal of chatting up a stranger can also be seen in Ryan's method. Of course, he makes arguments, particularly the big case for compatibility that I've just summarized, but his claims don't often break down into discrete subclaims that are prosecuted step by ruthless step. Instead, Ryan tends to turn the middle parts of his chapters and sections into hearths or sitting rooms, spaces in which two opposed or even estranged perspectives can have an opportunity to interact. It's all done unobtrusively, but once you get the hang of the technique, you can admire it as it unfolds. At different points, to identify just a few minor examples, these are not part of the main through line of the book, um, but they're significant, I think, for, for his method. Uh, the book stages conversations between, um, just a few examples, uh, settler colonial uh, studies and indigenous studies, monotheism and syncretism, uh, competing visions of land use and peoplehood, contrasting emphases in the theological camp known as the new divinity, between clashing understandings of English chosenness, between historically separate ideas of indigenous alienation, and more consequentially, between different ways of interpreting and different places for interpreting Occam's 1768 autobiography. One reason why these exchanges in the book don't end up mired in awkwardness is that Ryan, who's possessed of an obviously patient temperament, is moderating them. He's moderating these exchanges. In chapter two, titled Occam, Obviously, he develops a model for reading Occam, obviously, um, that, that defers to the author's own stated or implied preferences. Acknowledging Occam's literary sovereignty, Ryan writes, requires taking seriously his intentions about how interactions between himself and his readers should go, even if this type of acknowledgement entails overriding disciplinary norms about the objectivity of the literary text. Interpretation should, Ryan is proposing here, emphasize how Occam meant to present himself on the surface of his texts. And this comes to mean approaching the task of interpretation in terms that are, to quote Ryan yet again, basically interpersonal. The idea is that the primary text arbitrates between the reader on one side and the author on the other. I'm not always quite sure how widely Occam's own writings can be expected to serve this intermediary function, given the considerable historical distance involved. But Ryan's book serves it remarkably well. It's sometimes as though he's helping each of his modern readers communicate intimately with Samson Occam, sifting through the unfamiliar context they need, making sense of the man's intersecting traditions, and, as needed, explaining his jokes. <laughs> I'm imagining here the reader as the farmer in the episode I began with, and Ryan as an additional presence, sitting between the farmer and Occam on the fireplace. And yet, Ryan's book also knows that even with the helpful presence of a skilled interpreter who mediates between two strangers, even when the interpersonal has come to include three interlocutors rather than just two, Occam has good reason not to bring everything to the surface. Thank you very much. So, Ryan, you have um, 10 to 15 minutes of time for response. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you again to everyone. I mean, this, there's, um, I'm very moved by, by everyone's words. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, one of the, one of the topics that as a literary scholar who, who as, as Dustin's kind of brought out, you know, is trained to think about the, the objectivity of the literary text, you know, one of the things that was maybe the methodologically the most rewarding thing about this project was just having an opportunity to, to rethink that and to challenge the assumption that, that literary studies needs to 
be that kind of textual encounter, you know, which is, which is obviously, I'm not saying the people in literary studies today just take that at face value, but I think that studying, um, doing indigenous studies, which is, which is about native agency, kind of requires you to make some kind of case for how you can be a scholar that is foregrounding the agency or individual or collective of a native writer without talking about what they intended. Um, so, so as I'm, I'm really glad just that you were, you brought that out. That 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 is a kind of provocation, I guess, of the book. That that um, doing literary studies at the intersection of indigenous studies forces people who are trained um, according to literary theoretical methodologies to 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 revisit this issue of interpersonality and intentionality. So um, I have to say that while I I know that that's right. <laughs> that I think that there's still just so much work to be done to figure this out um, because because there's just not a lot of you don't get a lot of help uh, from um, in, in many ways the discipline of Native American literary studies is a very post structuralist discipline um, and it, it's a discipline that that is it, it skews more towards structure than agency uh, I would say and especially part of when Dustin also alluded to this distinction between indigenous studies and settler colonial studies. Um, I mean, I, I make the case, or I, I, I think that, and I, and I make the case in the book that indigenous studies is about agency and settler colonial studies tends to be about structure and overdetermination. So I'm kind of on the former side in this book. And I, 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 I think that that puts me in kind of dangerous territory um, for some, for some, literary theorists, I suppose, but I think that I'm just trying to process that and to think through it and to um, make a case that it's at least a defensible position that can be um, that can be further developed. Um, yeah, I, I, I there's again, there's just so much to respond to. I think that kind of going this relates to something Amy was talking about, which is um, Working and this is one of the most important things that I've learned from working with with you and with Brother Town and with Mohegan. It it's really just very valuable sometimes to know what someone was trying to do, <laughs> and um, and what they what they thought that they were up to, and that that's something that I think has <clears throat> been informed by collaboration for me, and um, and and but it again it raises this issue of is that really what literary scholars do? Um, and and so yes, I'm making the case that that it, that it can be. And I, I don't think I think that part of what the book is maybe arguing a subtext of the book's argument is that is that um, just asking what someone was trying to do can have a kind of social and political purpose. It can be a kind of alliance if you're not if you're not indigenous maybe, and you're trying to do work in collaboration. Um, I'm not saying that it's a new. I'm not trying to advance a new literary theory, <laughs> but I, I think it can be. It's just something that I'm trying to add to the conversation. Um, on the topic of uh, Hillary, I, I love this comparison about selective um, biblicism and how Occam was trying to. He was selective about native tradition, and I think that this is the most. It can be a very hard thing to accept about Occam, because we have this idea that native traditionalists have to love all their traditions. Um, and that is the approach that some indigenous traditionalists take, you know, it's very, but you can't, you know, obviously any generalization about what is indigenous traditionalism is, is bound to fail. But, you know, what you see in Mohegan in the, 19, in, the, in the 19th century is that there is a tradition of Mohegan tradition, a tradition of Mohegan traditionalism. There's a Mohegan traditionalism that emerges that's also Christian, that is about basically syncretism. And the, the um, Mohegan traditionalism in the 19th century was about writing down everything that our ancestors have done and, and compiling a kind of encyclopedic knowledge of what, of what, of what our people do. Um, and, and the reason I think that that understanding of indigenous traditionalism is, has kind of crowded out what Occam was doing as a traditionalist is that it aligns better with a kind of default mentality that um, people have in a secular world, which is that basically tradition is a rubric 
under that can include things like Christianity and Mohegan, you know, medicine practices and things like that. Um, but that, I guess, part of the and one of the arguments to make in, in chapter two is that this is a this is just a needs to be historicized. This is not the way that all people think about tradition. It's it's not always about including everything into the kind of framework that you already have. You know, for Occam, if you Occam's traditionalism involved putting yourself in perceptual touch with the with the sacred and with other people, and learning to see other people as as valuable. And, and if in order to train yourself to see the world in this way, and which, which was also a way of recovering, I think, what Occam thought his ancestors, the way that they saw the world, you have to acknowledge that some things might get in the way. And, and so Occam had, he had pretty nasty things to say, especially early in his career, about, um, about Northeast Native traditions that he thought were idolatrous, to be blunt about it. Occam was a, especially, again, early in his career, he was, he was a kind of iconoclast. And he thought that there were certain kinds of practices that didn't help you see the divine. And, um, you know, I just think it's important to, to be honest about this. <laughs> and, and even though it's difficult and it's, it's maybe not something that was, he had to do, um, but that was his style. And I think that Occam's iconoclasm helps um, explain why his traditionalism took the peculiar form that it did and why it placed such a great emphasis on seeing other people as sacred. Um, because he thought that that was, that was an indigenous tradition that was, you know, fully compatible with the kind of, um, the kind of Protestantism he was, he was trying to practice. I think, um, I don't know, I'd love to hear, uh, I'd, I'd love to hear Hillary say more about, um, about yeah, textual communication and um, I, having the, the work that you've done is so important to me about literacy and mediation. Um, you know, I, I guess that um, <laughs> I'm, I, I suppose that I'm interested in, in rethinking what it means to, to write, you know, and to, and to speak. And here, I'm very influenced by Michael, who's here. Um, the, the idea that the kind of literacy that Occam had was, has to be understood, not in terms of the acquisition of a kind of foreign technology of writing. Um, it, it was that, but it was also, and Occam didn't learn to write till he was 17, which I think is really important to realize. You know, it was, it was a foreign technology to him in a way, but it was, um, literacy was also contextualized as part of this uh, habitus that his people had of talking and writing. Writing was a way of talking to people from other other nations. So, um, so yeah, that's another. I'm I'm really glad that 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 topic came up too. I think the last thing that I that I want to say and and I think that deserves more research on Occam that. Um, I've only begun to do in the book is has to do with the idea of of liberation theology specifically. One of it's it's a very interesting historiographical fact, I guess, about the study of Samson Occam that for so long he was called the Indian Moses, as if his role was to kind of bring his people to the promised land and give them a new law. And one of the striking things about Occam is that he he explicitly says something that I think many of us can probably relate to today, which is that English people, what, you know, white people, and, and, and including the new US, you know, Occam lived through the founding of the USA. He said, let those people think that about themselves. You know, that's their story. Let them think the, that of, of New England as Zion. We're gonna be the Gentiles <laughs> and, and, and we're gonna be good with that, you know? So I think that this is a really important, um, theological intervention that Occam made. And it's not, I have to say, I don't think it's one that was incredibly influential. Um, a, a lot of other later indigenous Christians did understand native freedom in terms of this exodus kind of motif, which is, which is the central motif of all liberation theology, arguably, or historically is a very central motif to liberation theology. I think the fact that Occam refused to take this on board and to understand native people as a kind of 
going through a kind of exodus has to do with his understanding of the Bible, not as a kind of law, uh, not, as, not, as, not as divine law, but rather as a kind of aid to perception. And I, I, just, I think I'll just close by reading something from a hymn that Occam wrote that, that I think really helped, helped me understand this. And this is, this, is, this is really a connection also back to Jonathan Edwards and the idea of religious perception. Let me see if I can find this quote real quick. So the, 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 in, in one of his hymns, Occam describes the experience of reading the Bible and how, how frustrating it could be <laughs> and how it can only get you so far because you can read the Bible over and over again and still not get saved. And, and in the hymn, it's, it, he says, I read my Bible, it was plain, the sinner must be born again or feel the wrath of God. I heard some tell how Christ did give his life to let the sinner live, but him I could not see. But as my soul with dying breath was gasping in eternal death, Christ Jesus I did spy. And so he's reading and reading and reading and trying to get it, and he knows everyone's talking about this, but it, at some point he just has to see Christ. Um, and, and so I think that this perceptual kind of Edwardsian influenced version of evangelical theology, if you like, was, was really central to what Occam was doing. And one of my, I'll just close with my favorite, one of my favorite letters that ever got written to Occam was from an Anglican minister who saw Occam preach when he was traveling in England. And this minister said something to Occam like, um, you know, it was great to, it was great, I think I might even have it here. It was great to see you preach, but um, I wish in your sermon you hadn't spent the whole time telling us that we were all um, dead and numb like stones. <laughs> and for, but for Occam, that was what it was all about. You know, it was about, it was about trying to get people not to be numb. Um, and, and I think that that is what ties a lot of this together for me. So thank you so much. For <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. So um, we have um, about half an hour left. Uh, you, you, you posed a question, at least um, to, to, to the panelists and in, or, or, you know, in your, in your replies that, that might elicit some further comments from them. But um, before we do that, uh, I, I do want to open it up to the floor and give the audience a chance to, to um, contribute to the discussion tonight so who would like to i think i understood you all to mention his execution sermon what was that <laughs> no no i did not think i mean he's, i assume he survived that but he was discoursing on the idea of executing i mean was he um anti-death penalty? I mean, is that what that means? Um, we, I, yeah, we could all, I think, t speak to this, but, um, you know, uh, in 1772, there, there was a, um, a, a Wampanoag a man named Moses Paul, who was in a, a barroom fight in, I think this was north of New Haven, and he killed, um, he killed someone. And he was um, convicted of murder. And he asked Occam to deliver the sermon at his execution. Um, and so Occam delivered this sermon, which it, I, I mean, I guess to answer your question directly, he didn't really exactly say that I'm anti death penalty in the sermon. Um, I, you know, I, I think that um, he, he, he talks about sin, and he, he attributes the, the downfall of Moses Paul to sin. And, and it's a very, in a way, a very traditional New England execution sermon in the sense that it, the Bible is at the center of it and this kind of Pauline conception of the wages of sin are, is death, you know, is, is his text. And, um, and so, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a difficult text to read, uh, and, but, it's, but it's, it, it became Occam's most famous piece of writing because it was published um, and became a bestseller. I think it was reprinted more than 20 times in the 18th century, which, which actually made it rival writings by Tom Paine. Like this, it was a really an outrageous number of sermons that were sold, partly because of the spectacle of seeing the native minister sermonizing about his own kindred, I suppose, um, was probably how it was seen. 
But one of the things that I talk about with the sermon um, in, the, in the book is that in the preface to the published version of the sermon, Occam, this, this is where one of the places where Occam really lays out what I call the broadcast understanding of indigeneity, because he says in, this, in the preface to the sermon, listen, there's been so many sermons about this, especially this text from Paul, the wages of sin is death. I mean, hundreds. Why, why do we need another sermon about this topic? And Occam says, well, my, you can understand what I'm going to say, because uh, my, my talk, he says, is plain, common, everyday talk. Um, and everyone will be able to understand it because I'm an Indian. And so this, it's, it's a really important text for, for me um, because it's a place where Occam establishes a connection between the accessibility of his language and the fact that it can be understood by everyone and his Indianness, which otherwise has no obvious connection <laughs> to, to why his writings would be easy to understand. Because you would, you know, we, we would think that as writing as an indigenous person to non-indigenous people, it would be hard to understand him. So I, I make the case in the book that the only real way to understand this preface is that Occam is, is talking about tradition. And he's saying that as an Indian, I can speak to everyone um, because that's what my people do. So anyway, there's a ton more we can say about this, about the execution sermon. It's, it's, a, it's a fascinating text. And um, I think it was kind of what established Occam's reputation as an author. Um, and it was also published in Welsh. In Cardiff, <laughs> I'm, I'll, I'll just add to it that that uh, I think everything that Ryan said. The the only slightly ironic piece is that it's not a, an easy read, mm -hmm. but every other sermon that Occam ever wrote is extraordinarily accessible and really. Um, he, he was delivering them orally, and so his his notes. I mean, he he writes them out, but they're much more accessible and they're much more um, radical in their thinking. Um, and, and it's one of the things that Ryan does so effectively is he doesn't stop at the execution sermon, which is a very formal document that's very much a written text, but he turns to those, those orally delivered sermons and the, the notes that Occam kept of those, so. I guess the, uh, following up also, the, this is a moment in the book where the, um, I think, productive generative tension I was trying to pinpoint comes out because the point is not just, see, we, we take the sermon to mean what its words say they mean, you know, what, what they, what they self-evidently superficially say. You give us a really like sophisticated um, contextualization of the sermon, which actually shows that it's intervening in a, a pretty kind of thorny theological debate associated with a particular camp, but that camp turns out to be subdivided in these different ways. And I found it revelatory, but it's not what the words say on the surface, you know what I mean? And, and it's that back and forth between the, the, the straightforward legibility, broadcastability of the sermon and its highly situated nature that, you're, that you know, people aren't going to see without, without your help. Um, but a person at that time, I think hearing it or even reading it would have gotten it, right? But what Ryan's able to do is able to digest it in a way that today we can, like that's the best part, you know, in the beginning you talk about how the distance between us and Occam and the distance between Occam and Joan of Arc. <laughs> you know, that um, we're so far away from him that we, we're missing that social context. Um, but I, when we read the, the sermon, I just envisioned it as being something that wasn't supposed to be read. It's something that's supposed to be spoken and by speaking it, you understand it more clearly, almost like a Shakespearean play, you know, mm -hmm. that you can read it, but when you hear it, it resonates and sticks with you more. Um, but I, I love what you did. Thank you. Yeah, yeah um, I, if I can just jump back in one sec and say something up, up to, up to Dustin's point about this tension, which I think is great, that I, I uh, and and I, I love the way you've brought it out. Um, and uh, the, I make the case that reading, I'm doing a kind of surface reading in the book, but it, it is also the case that like, it's very contextual and, and requires a lot of um, <laughs> um, secondary research to make these obvious kind of readings. Uh, I think that, I guess that when I was in graduate school, one of my professors had me read Spinoza's Theological, pra 
theological political treatise. Um, and in, 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 and I teach this book now because I love it so much, but Spinoza, who is in a way inventing the discipline of philology in, in a way in that book makes, he, he observes that when you read the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible and, and the books and, and the text says, God is fire. And then you, you flip through a few more pages and the text says, God is wind, you know, you can spend all the time you want trying to figure out how God can both be fire and wind, or you can think about the context and ask why at one moment, you know, the prophet says God is fire. And then the next moment he says that God is wind. And, and in order, Spinoza says that it's dumb to try to rationally reconcile these two statements. The way that you have to understand them is by asking what the prophet was trying to do. And, and that's, in a way, the version of contextual intentionalism that I'm trying to do. It's, it's, it's not to say that obvious, to read outcome obviously is not to just kind of crudely um, take on board what, what he's saying without trying to contextualize it. You have to, in order to make rational sense of it in a way, you have to break things apart and put them in the moment and in the interaction that they were designed for, <laughs> if that makes sense. So. Other questions from the audience? Um, thanks, Ryan. Oh, thank, you. <laughs> thank you, microphone. Um, and thanks for this panel. This is really illuminating and exciting to listen to. Um, I want to I would love to hear more about a phrase that Hillary used, and I'd love to hear, Ryan, you reflect on this, the way that archives have historically occluded agency. And can you talk about um, what that means and how, and your methodology given that political problem? Yeah, uh, I mean, here I am really influenced by Hillary's work because um, <laughs> Hillary Hillary's really brought out the the kind of colonial ideology of what what native literacy is about and 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 the kind of default position from which indigenous authors are supposed to kind of contribute to the archive. Um, so yeah, for the one of the ways that archives have included indigenous, indigenous agency that I've talked about in, in the book is 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 by basically by tokenizing, you know. And and so this is probably the 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 most straightforward way to see what's happened to Occam over time is that people who created American literature anthologies wanted to have a, a sermon by a Christian Indian, so they they went for Moses Paul because it was a bestseller, um, and it was it was clearly incredibly intelligent and dense. And I think that probably a lot of the people who anthologized the sermon never really read the whole thing because because no one ever really analyzed it. Um, fully, but, but so tokenization is, is a big part of it. Um, it has also to do, I suppose, with the way that his archives have been handled materially and the fact that most of his papers are, um, were until recently at Dartmouth and at Connecticut Historical Society, you know, that, that in itself is a kind of political, politically telling thing. Um, so yeah, those are, those are a couple, a couple of things that I, that I, that I would say. Uh, there was another point that I wanted to make. Um, Hillary, do you want to? Do you want to? Um, well, to I would only just jump in on the Dartmouth piece. So, so Samson Occam's papers, the probably the most significant collection of Samson Occam's papers, were at Dartmouth College, which meant that Eliezer Wheelock, who was the person who founded Dartmouth, in other words, who mm -hmm. most viciously betrayed Occam, collected his papers. Right, so there's a particular kind of violence to that archive and the fact that Occam is, was for a very, very long time most uh, studied and understood in the context of Dartmouth College, mm -hmm. right? And then the Connecticut Historical Society had sort of the second largest collection of Samson Occam's papers and actually you, I think, did some interest. There's been some really interesting work about like where 
why the Connecticut Historical Society? Where did that, right? And so there, there are all these ways in which who has what and why and who got it and why did they have it and right like so th there's so many pieces to that archival violence and the the exciting coda to all of that is that dartmouth has recently rematriated or repatriated uh occam's papers to mohegan so that there there has been sort of a concession that that Dartmouth was never the rightful home for for mm -hmm. those papers, uh, and it's something that you you talk about and that you know was uh, just an extraordinary thing that 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 happened a few months ago, you know. So, yeah, th just to add to that, um, thank you. Uh, the, it, it it also bears on this issue of Mohegan Brother Town because, um, as Hillary was saying, why did Occam's papers go to to Dartmouth, well, it's because they were, people assumed that they were, we, Wheelock, you know, that, that Wheelock had them for some reason. And, and, and this idea that the papers went from Connecticut to New Hampshire really was important for creating this image of Occam as a Mohegan, even though it seems very likely, as I argue, that he took a lot of these papers with him to upstate New York. And they, we don't really fully know how they made it to Dartmouth, but it wasn't because some dude from Connecticut took them there. So um, the fact that that was always the default assumption, that, that, that somehow Occam's writings naturally would have wound up back in the hands of his tutor, um, is, plays into the, the fact that these are not seen as brother town Mohegan archives. They're seen as Mohegan archives. And um, I don't think it's, it's, it's taking anything away from the importance of what Dartmouth did to, to say that. Well, and so, and, and a, a significant chunk of the, of Ryan's analysis of the autobiography does this incredible move of recovering its sort of archival sort of trajectory and that it's not a Dartmouth document, it's a Brotherton document, right? Like that it actually lived in upstate New York, right? And uh, it's very compelling evidence and it fundamentally alters how we understand that document, that it wasn't a Wheelock document, it was a Brotherton. And if I could just add the Brotherton Mohegan component to it, um, Mohegan included Brothertown in that ceremonial acceptance of the papers. Um, and it was a beautiful opportunity for our governments to be together, even though Mohegan is the home for it, the sort of recognition of Occam's duality and his dual identity as being Mohegan and Brothertown. Um, uh, I can't thank Mohegan enough for that inclusion of our tribal council at the ceremony and the sort of brotherly love that still exists between our two nations. It, it means a lot. Yes. Uh, Ryan, I wonder if you could just say a little bit more about the radical hospitality that's in the title of your book because I think that sort of fell off the table a little bit today, but I'll offer you just like a simple, like dumb observation that I had about it, which is that um, if you think about stranger sociability in evangelicalism, in contrast to the, what's called the magisterial reformation of the local pastoral care, it looks like it's modern, you know, that you're calling people out to something more like a voluntary affiliation and you're breaking with the tradition of the pastoral local church as the default form of membership, looks really like a modern aspect of evangelicalism. But in Occam's world, this openness to strangers is exactly the traditional thing. So it seems like you've got a real, you know, the prism just turns a little bit and it goes traditional, modern, traditional, modern. Can you say more about that? Thanks, Michael. Um... I think only you could say that that's a simple question. <laughs> um, but um, part of it is that I, I, one thing I would say in response to that um, is that, which is a great, it's a great question. Will, William Apis, the Pequot writer, you know, talks about when he decided to become a Methodist. He says that the Presbyterians were oppressing my people, um, and 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 I. I saw a group of Methodists 
um, in congregation, and I decided that they were the people of God. And so I became a Methodist at that time. And so part of the kind of denominational landscape that you're kind of alluding to as distinctively modern and kind of maybe post Occam a little bit has to do with this idea of the religious person choosing for themselves what kind of what kind of congregation is God's people. And I, Occam didn't really talk about it in that way, partly because the his con, the discourse of God's people in his milieu was so filled up by settler colonial nationalism and this kind of exceptionalist narrative of of the settler state as God's people. So when he counterposed God's people to God's, he, he counterposed God's people to God, to not God's people. And he's, he identified with the latter. That's what's at stake partly in Occam's likening of Native Americans to Gentiles, that they're not like the chosen nation. Um, so I think that the discourse toward the end of his lifetime shifted such that one could choose which of these people is God's people and then sign up. But Occam, um, he didn't, his approach to, um, I, it's really, Occam's kind of in the middle between federal theology and this kind of denominational landscape. And I think that he was refusing while also kind of recuperating this kind of covenant theology of chosen nationhood. Um, so that would be one way to maybe historicize the, what he's doing. Can I ask a follow-up question? Um, and I'll, I wanna try to phrase it for the sake of people who haven't read the book. Um, but this is a this is an interesting kind of counter counterintuitive you know reading that that you know Occam rejects a, a, a language of chosenness and embraces a sense of not chosen or never chosen. If you're if you're unfamiliar with this idiom or its moment, it might sound like he's sort of claiming damnation, you know. But you're actually saying that you know he's he's claiming a version of uh, the the sort of figure or the persona of the the Gentile in in, in Paul's letters as a, a sort of radically prophetic, you know, position um, that's in some ways truer than the chosenness, which actually leads to a kind of encrusted, encrusted self-satisfaction, you know, because the chosen are at some point going to be unchosen. So the non-chosen is an alternative to the chosen unchosen. Is that right? Exactly, yeah. I mean, okay. it, it, it's a very complicated story, but, but so Jonathan Edwards, you know, was still very much a part of this kind of theology of chosenness and thinking about England, uh, you know, in those terms. But his, you know, by, by the generation after Edwards, his students were starting to realize that this was kind of bad theology. So the new divinity movement that, that Occam was really of a moment with talked about, they said that wherever the spirit is, that's God's people. You know, we need to give up on this, this kind of New England, um, this idea of New England is somehow chosen. And, and so, uh, and so, yeah, so, so there, it's not like everyone around Occam, the intellectuals that he, that he dealt with were also critical of this kind of idiom of this kind of Israelite um, metaphor, but, but, but no one took the further step that Occam took of saying that the, the real underlying issue in this kind of covenant, covenant theological language about chosenness is, is, is the law, you know? And it's the idea of having scripture and having having this being the privileged nation because you have the bible that's what the that's what the english said and that's also what the young united states people preachers said did keep saying that and so um so that's what he got out of paul and the gentiles is the idea that the law is not a text you know it's written in your heart and and uh and i think that it's 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 that kind of radically inward conception of the law that's not a, it's not actually textual at all that makes Occam such an interesting reader of Paul. And, it, and just for the record, it, I mean, it also explains why over the course of his career, I think Occam became increasingly less convinced that the way to help his people was to get them to read the Bible. Um, because it, if, if salvation wasn't a question of having the law as a textual artifact, then it could be, some, it could be something else. And, and it meant that he could focus um, more on tradition and perception and a kind of a, a, a form of being religious together that that wasn't quite so Bible thumping. So I think it's actually, uh, this is a really important um, issue for understanding what he was doing. There's a certain, there's a, the other, another influence that I kind of allude to in the book is Quakerism, which, you know, Occam knew some Quakers. Um, it's, it's hard to prove a direct kind of theological influence, but 
Quakers were the people in this period, especially a little earlier, who, who were saying stuff like, yes, yes, humans are sinners, but nature is, is not a sinner. Um, and and Quakers, Quakers had a conception of, of soteriology or of salvation um, that, was, um, that was about, they, they, you know, sometimes people say that Quakers kind of equated soteriology with eschatology, that they, that they thought they, that the, the kind of cosmic drama of salvation only really played out in individual souls. Um, and I think that Occam, Occam was kind of like that a little bit in the sense that he, he didn't think that nature in general was corrupt or that the world in general was corrupt. And he even compares Brothertown at one point to the Garden of Eden. He says that it, it, life there was like the Garden of Eden, which was the Garden of God. And so you get this real sense that Occam is trying to see the, the physical world and in some sense, the social world is still sacred. Um, and I think that this kind of Pauline conception of salvation helped him do that. Um, not to get too far deep in the weeds with, <laughs> with all that. Yes, Nania. Thank you. Um, OK, so I've been trying to formulate this question in a coherent way, and I'm going to give it my best shot. <laughs> Um, but Ms. Medford, you mentioned, um, I'm not a Christian, but I'm a Christian Indian. This is, raises a really interesting um, point for me. Um, I study a much later time period, but I, I was wondering if, you know, perhaps you could help flesh out what that meant and means for people in Brotherton to say Christian Indian, because colloquially folks might think like that's a native person who is Christian, but it, it means something different, if I'm not mistaken. And then sec just the other piece of that is like, how are we working with this analytic alongside the sort of uh, praying towns in, in New England um, at the time? And like, what is the relationship of uh, native, or like indigenous traditionalism within Christianity? How is it adapting? And I apologize if you flesh this out in the book, I haven't read it yet, but I will. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, the the Christian identity and me being a Christian Indian, um, I think that that's more personal to me. That I grew up and I was raised in a family, uh, my parents aren't Christians, um, but my brother town identity comes through my father. My father's both brother town and Menominee. And um, my grandmother, my, my grandfather passed away when my dad was young. Um, so the brother town sort of identity is what sticks with me. It's not, it's different from my dad because my dad was with his father. Um, so the Menominee identity, I, I know familial ties, but that identity is different for me. Um, but I can't negate her Christian influence or the influence that Christianity has had on my family for generations before her. And I don't want to. I want to claim it because I'm proud of, of our history. And I don't know if I was proud when I was young because I didn't get it. I thought being a Christian Indian meant that I was assimilated. But if Samson Occam, if his identity of, you know, Christian Indians was to assimilate, he would have never envisioned Brother Town. He would have said, we stay here. We integrate with them, right? But no, there is a, there is the separateness. There is an other, and that's Brother Town. So I can't, I can't, um, I can't separate that out of what's influencing me, my decisions, my familial roles, my community roles, um, even if I have more traditional practices that guide me. Um, there is one God. <laughs> um, yeah, on the topic of the praying towns, it's a it's a really interesting question, and it's not easy to answer. I'm, I, I think that the and Hillary, you might have thoughts about this too, but that there's not a lot of evidence that there was direct influence between the Praying Town's formation and, and Brother Town. 
but that, but that you could you might think that there there is because of all the circumstantial kind of evidence for example there are there is a certain way in which you could make the case that brother town in upstate new york was a kind of planned community or an intentional community even and and so and it was a town <laughs> so that yeah so so th those 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 things make it seem kind of like the praying towns i mean the the, the biggest difference between brother town and the praying towns was that the brother town was was native folks idea <laughs> and, and it, it wasn't it wasn't put put it where it was as a kind of strategic it wasn't part of a kind of colonial strategy to put it where it was um so that that's the i guess the the most obvious difference i think that there are probably the kind of elliot um conception of what those towns were about was also was also quite different so i'm i'm, I'm of the mind that there's not that much in common but that it is interesting to think about brother town as a as a planned town that would be my, my short answer for that do you want to i mean the only thing that i would add to that is that the praying towns that their origins are 17th century whereas Occam is 18th century you know and it's not that they went away in the 18th century it's that that kind of that that early moment of real cultural violence was a 17th century kind of phenomenon so yeah we'll have time for one one last quick question sure Hi. thank you very much um i'm gonna bring us back to the textual if i can i'm interested in uh the conversation about writing as a foreign technology but also as an extension of native practice and so I'm, this might be a simplistic question but it with Occam, what do we learn about writing that maybe would be especially insightful for literary scholars or not? Um, is this something that uh, we would want to describe as a formal insight, or is it something beyond that? But what do we learn about about writing? That's a great question. As uh, you know, as you can tell, I'm trying to put pressure on the specificity of writing as the technology um and i that's you know that's what's at stake in the idea that in all of his ministry including his writing occam was part of a of this kind of emergent broadcast idea of indigeneity so that does kind of yeah raise the difficult question about the specificity of writing um there's a couple of different ways i guess of, of approaching it you know one is to say that yeah there are certain genres of sociability that occam engaged in that were exclusively writing manuscript um, and there was also there was also Occam was aware for sure that print kind of gave his writing a broader circulation and that that's partly what was behind the hymnal that he published in 1774 you know for me in, in in the book I this this issue of writing and of of kind of what is literature comes up more in the context of nationhood and the 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 connection, the historical connection between the idea of literature and the idea of a nation. And so I, I approach it, I guess, more from the reader's perspective and say, what does it mean to talk about something like Native American literary nationalism? Um, and I'm, 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 I guess I'm influenced a lot by those scholars who um, there's a there's the. I think it's Jace Weaver who says that drawing on um, another kind of scholar that what is a literature is just basically all the stuff that people from one nation wrote down that they care about it's a and and i'm i'm kind of on board with that as a kind of definition of of, of literature which doesn't i don't have a formal kind of criterion of the literary that i would want to stick with in the book i don't think I, you, I could be wrong <laughs> i don't think i do i feel like i'm speaking on behalf of your book to you <laughs> but the book is really invested in the materiality of writing yeah. and in the tangible the tangibility of of writing and i i also see um a commitment to verbal play visually expressed you know in the book that i don't know if it, i don't know that that's captured in the nationhood mm -hmm. you know frame that you just provided you know yeah. Um, so you you provide this other frame, uh, not that they're competing, but but I do think that someone who's looking for form will find um, attention to the tangible and tactile and um, the fun that can be had with it, you know, as well as the work that can be done with it. Thank you, Justin. Well, and I, yeah, and so I, I think we, we need to correct 
<laughs> Under, understanding of his own own book here, yeah. <laughs> no, but I, I will also add that Occam was a teacher as well as a, a minister, and so he, in his autobiography, he has a sort of an extensive analysis of the teaching of writing, and so it it's not a, you know what I mean. He's very conscious of what it is to write as opposed to speak, right? So we have him we sort of understand him as a teacher, like really literally like helping children hold a pen, understand an alphabet. And then we have him as a minister where he's primarily speaking, right? So we have this tension between the oral and the written and he's, it, his mastery of both forms is really extraordinary. And the way that he plays with both of them, I think is, is really powerful. So, and, and you do quite a bit with that in your book. <laughs> sure. I, I, don't, I don't mean to say that I don't care about writing at all. Um, so I, I really appreciate that. You're bringing out things that I, I missed in this context. Yeah. And, and this isn't my field of study, um, but the, the care that Occam takes with his books. Mm -hmm. um, he he's he's he loves his. These are his prized possessions, um, so much so that he's willing to haul them back and forth all over the place while he's traveling. Um, but I think that he he's he through these books he sees how important a written document can be, mm -hmm. and how that transmits knowledge and how that could be beneficial to his people. Um, and, and I think that, that, that that's sort of Definitely. why he cares so much about it. Yeah. And, and, if, and if you don't know, he, he like comes up with these amazing flashcards for these kids that's, you know, just before anybody else is talking about this in the education world, you know, he's created these little things for the kids to trace. It's pretty cool. Well, um, the testament to the excitement of the book that here we are uh, over time, um, but uh, happily so. Um, Ryan, thank you so much for writing this book, and Hillary and Amy and Dustin for, for joining us to discuss it, and to everyone for uh, joining for the uh, event tonight. Uh, there's one final stage, which is a bit of um, wine and cheese in the... Uh, lounge, so please stay and uh, raise a glass to, to Ryan and, and Samson Malcolm. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>